Okay. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Carolyn, for being here. Uh, this is spring break in the US, so uh, Caroline is on holiday, and she's so kind to uh, spend her time with us, and we really appreciate you being with us. Thank you very much, Caroline. I, I knew Caroline, I think, four years ago in San Diego in, in mm -hmm. the CSD 16th century conference, and uh, I, I enjoyed a lot. Uh, four of us. That that that's actually the usual thing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um I knew I knew Caroline in San Diego four years ago and I heard her presentation and, and it was fantastic. Uh she, she needs to know that we've been already discussing uh gender roles in Renaissance art and also erotics in, in Italian Renaissance art. So they are quite familiar with the issues you are going to talk about and, and please feel confident. Their English is much better than mine. They are completely proficient in English. No worries about that. They, I, I'm pretty sure they will have plenty of interesting questions at, at the end of your presentation. But if it's okay with you, can we interrupt you when, when you're speaking? Is, is that okay with you? Oh my goodness, yes, please. Like, um, just go ahead and interrupt me because I might, uh, my screen for you is really tiny. So I might not miss you uh, raising your hand. So feel free to like yell at oh, me and be like, Caroline. Theoretically, the camera should be following us as we are speaking. Hello. <laughs> okay, the camera is not working at all. So sorry about that. <laughs> oh. Anyway, uh, I, I would like to introduce you with your uh, presentation. Uh, Caroline Thomas uh, is actually assistant professor of art history at Angelo State University. Angelo State is uh, it's, it's not that big, actually, Angelo State, right? It's got like no. 16,000 or something like that. 10,000 kids. 10,000, so it's more or less like the Ibero, but it's a nice public state university in the western part of Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that means in the other part of Texas, Houston, Dallas, Austin uh, are in the eastern part of the state. So Angelo State is more in the other part of the state. Uh, she uh, teaches uh, surveys in the department, but her research considers early modern Italian art through the lenses of gender and sexuality studies. Um, she has presented her work internationally at conferences uh, such as the Renaissance Society of America in a week, uh, RSA, mm -hmm. College Art Association a uh, couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, and the 16th Century Society, and has presently published several articles and papers considering early modern women's reception of erotic art. Her talk today, while at first broadly Conceives uh, go, 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 go. the art and life of Lavinia Fontana. We end with her own research project on the artist about her new Minerva dress. This is Italian Renaissance art classroom. Uh, Jimena, and Monse, and Isabel, and Joshua, and Sofia are eager to hear you. And, and, and I know they are going to have a lot of fun. Again, thank you very much, Caroline, for being with us. Uh, it's, it's such a pleasure, and, and above all, Caroline is my friend, so please be kind with her. Uh, don't get mad here, guys and girls. Uh, we are all yours, Caroline, and again, thanks, 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 thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm glad we figured out that there's a time difference here uh, as of yesterday, or I would have been an hour late, perhaps, or an hour early. I'm still unsure. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for having me here today. And thanks especially uh, to Javier Dr. Cuesta for inviting me. Uh, I'm glad we were able to make it work out. Uh, I'm excited to share my uh, research with you on Lavinia Fontana, alongside just saying a little bit about her life and career as an early modern painter uh, in Bologna and Rome, Italy. Uh, first off, you can hear me okay, and you can see what's on the screen here. Okay, perfect. Just wanted to double check. Uh, so uh, you, we already talked about this, but please feel free at any time to interrupt me if you have a question or comment. 
Um, this first half of the lecture is going to be a little more interactive. Uh, so I'll ask a couple questions and have us talk about some works. Um, but for the second half of this class, so roughly in an hour or so, um, I'm actually going to present um, specifically my research on uh, one of the last paintings that Lavinia Font Fontana painted in her life. And you can see that on the lower right hand side of the screen, uh, the goddess Minerva. So I look forward to sharing that with you and hearing uh, your feedback. So let's go ahead and get started. All right. And you can see that switched on your end too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. All right, so like I just said, for the first half of this class, like for the first hour, I just wanna give you an overview of some of the works that Fontana has created throughout her life. So uh, Lavinia Fontana, whose dates, uh, as you can see, are 1552 to 1614, is thought by many to be one of the first professional working uh, artists in Italy um, that was a woman. Uh, Fontana worked on many prestigious private commissions for Bolognese and Roman nobility and foreign dignitaries throughout her life, um, getting patrons like the King of Spain even under her belt. And as we'll see later today, she uh, got quite a few works from cardinals and popes as well. So painting throughout her 11 pregnancies, Fontana produced large-scale portraits that are notable for their luminous coloring and for her attention to those really fine decorative details in clothing and jewelry, as you can see here on the screen. Uh, she complemented these portraits as well with a number of religious paintings. Uh, she made some altarpieces and small devotional works, a few of which I'll show you in a bit, uh, not to mention several mythological scenes, which I'm um, most interested in, perhaps, in my own research. And lastly, in what was an unprecedented honor at the time, Fontana's reputation was confirmed in her lifetime when she was admitted essentially into the illustrious Guild for Painters in Rome, the Accademia di San Luca. Um, she was one of the first women to achieve this award. So she really was a pioneer uh, when it came to uh, being a woman artist in Italy. Yeah, yeah, so, if I may, uh, sorry, Caroline. Uh, yeah. I, I would like to highlight uh, what an honor was uh, the admission of Lavinia in, in San Luca uh, Brotherhood. Yes. First of all, because of how many painters were left out of the uh, mm -hmm. of fraternity, but also the fact that she was indeed a woman. And, and right. that was highly unusual for, for that time. Yeah, I'm, I'm fairly certain she was the first. And if not, like, you know, there was a handful of women prior to her. Um, and so, even Sofonita and Wiesola had many, many trouble with that and, and was not able to do it in, in her lifetime. Yes. Yeah, and I'll talk, like, very sparingly about her as well, because she's one of those women artists that preceded Lavinia and was very successful in her own right, but uh, still had, I think, a few limitations that uh, Lavinia, she was able to break a few of those barriers, such as like getting into the Academy of St. Luke, right? Yeah. Um, and then having uh, 11 pregnancies, that just blows my mind every time I, I, I read that. Oh, uh, I huge, can't imagine. A huge ah uh -huh was heard here in the classroom when you said about 11 <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, Awesome. Okay. So I want to go back in time a bit uh, to Fontana's earlier years uh, before we uh, look at some of her later work. So we know that she was uh, one of three children born to a Bolognese painter and teacher Prospero Fontana. And obviously uh, in Italy at this time, if you were lucky enough to become an artist uh, as a woman, you, usually your father was the one teaching you, uh, or at least a family member. And Prospero himself was a pretty uh, important artist. He worked on several important projects, including uh, some of the designs in Florence's Palazzo Vecchio, their city hall, uh, alongside the artist Prina Del Vago, Tadeo Zuccari, and jo Giorgio Fasari. Um, and he also had some pretty uh, impressive patrons, Pope Julius III, uh, Francis King Henry II, and Caterina de' Medici. 
So uh, meanwhile, Lavinia's mother also, uh, Antonia di Bartolomeo de Bonardis, came from a successful and very well-established family of printers and publishers. So she definitely grew up in a family surrounded by arts and literature. So the family's lifestyle uh, was somewhat tinged with tragedy uh, because Lavinia's older sister, Amelia, died at 16. And records show that her brother um, died not too much longer after Flaminio. So she was really the only surviving um, of her, her family. So returning uh, briefly to Prospero, he ran a very successful stu uh, studio in Bologna and taught even at uh, the University of Bologna and really a valued education. He taught all of his children. Uh, and it soon became evident uh, that Lavinia was really the one who possessed the greatest natural talent. And he seemed to focus his energies on training her. Uh, some of his other pupils included local painters like Lorenzo Sabatini, and uh, more famously, perhaps, Emile Caracci. Uh, and the Flemish sculptor, John Bologna, also worked uh, for a minute under him. So besides her artistic education under her father, uh, Lavinia undertook academic teachings, becoming a student of letters, learning mathematics, geometry, and Latin. She also studied music. Uh, she learned how to play the spinet, which is like a small type of clavichord. And I'll show you in just a moment, there's a, a portrait she painted of herself playing that instrument. And as scholars have noted, Fortuna, uh, Fontana was really lucky to grow up in Bologna. Um, for some reason, this city was really uh, probably the most, uh, I suppose, liberal when it came to accepting uh, women into these institutional uh, programs. So uh, Bologna, by the mid 16th century, around when she was born, was the second largest city in the Papal States. And even their patron saint was actually a woman convent painter, uh, one of them, Caterina de Vigri. And so this was a really uh, progressive city for the arts and allowing women into the academies. So how did Fontana get her start as an artist then? Well, uh, Prospero had served as the head of the Bolognese Painters Guild uh, on a number of occasions, uh, but he was suffering a lot of financial hardships right around when she was a, a kid and teenager. Um, for Giorgio Fasari even commented on his inability to pay back loans, taken out to finance a trip he wanted to go on in France and mentioned that in his Lives of the Artists on Prospero Fontana. So he was kind of known to be down on his luck financially. And many scholars agree that because of that, alongside you know his increasing age, um, he considered making Lavinia into her own artist, her own professional, you know, um, painter. So Fontana's earliest works uh, were smaller pieces um, and portraits that essentially clients were brought to her by her father. Um, he also helped essentially uh, market her work. Sometimes he would give away her pieces for free or at a nominal fee to help essentially raise her profile amongst potential patrons in Bologna. And it clearly worked out. <laughs> uh, in her father's workshop, then we believe that uh, Fontana learned the basic skills of design, uh, media preparation for painting, uh, and executing uh, works of art um, that was required of all young artists. Um, so with that uh, introduction, I want to turn to uh, the first work that we'll be looking at today um, by Fontana. So I, I, despite... uh, if, if I may interrupt you, I, I would like to stress on, on a couple of uh, circumstances, maybe three of them. First of all, the fact that Bologna was a different city than Rome, Firenze, or, or even Venice. Uh, Bologna mm -hmm. was a much more liberal city. Uh, because of the university, not only because of the university, but mainly because of the university. Uh, mm -hmm. Second of all, the fact that having a, a father painter was very important for, for women painters because yes. of the pre-existence of the workshop. I mean, it, the women painters were not, uh, it was not an easy task for them to have a, a, an, an own workshop. But yeah. if the worship was of the fathers, that, that was a very different thing. And, and thirdly, uh, the natural abilities of Lavinia for painting was also important uh, in relationship with the fact that the family was in, in economical need. 
So they yeah. were able to exploit the, uh, the ability. I, I, I think these three things together was very important in the fact that Lavinia was able to pursue that professional career in painting that in other circumstances, it, it, would, it could be very uh, much more yeah. difficult than that. Oh, yeah. It was like a perfect storm, you know, of like <laughs> happenings that allowed her, I think, to kind of rise among her ranks, you know, her gender, uh, mostly to become a successful artist. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Without her father, without residing in Bologna, Babette Bones' work has kind of shown how important that, you know, residing in Bologna was for women artists because of the university. Um, yeah, all of that really uh, helps kind of skyrocket her career. And without it, I don't think she would be known today, those three circumstances, certainly. Great. Uh, any other questions or comments? I'll try and keep, keep an eye on the time. I, I, I know I probably have too much, actually, to talk about in two hours, but... Um, be our guest. You okay. All right, well, let's uh, let's go ahead and look at this painting here, uh, which is actually one of my favorite uh, portraits uh, by Fontana. So regardless of her great talent, uh, Prospero, her dad, knew that to have a career as a woman painter in a patriarchal society like uh, early modern Italy, uh, regardless of living in Bologna, and without her being in like a member of court or in a convent, uh, his daughter really needed to take a, a husband to maintain her, um, uh, I guess, her social morality. So in 1577, um, he ends up marrying one of Prospero's uh, former students who was a local, a local painter from a family in Imola, uh, John Paolo Zappi, who was the son of a wealthy grain merchant. And Prospero negotiated with the Zappi family that in lieu of uh, providing them a dowry, Fontana would actually paint, uh, create works of art to earn an income for the family. And what is more, they agreed to the very unusual arrangement of having the newlyweds live with the bride's family, uh, as opposed to the groom's family or even uh, independently. So under this arrangement, both Lavinia and her husband would continue to learn um, from Prospero. It feels like a, a, a little, um, very much Prospero is working, you know, behind the scenes to work with stuff for him here. Um, but the Fontana Zappi marriage contract from 1577 on February 14th, I don't know if that's a coincidence, uh, states, Signor Don Paolo is obliged to come and live in Bologna and to stay and live with Signor Prospero. And the earnings that John Paolo and Madonna Lavinia make from art will be converted to the benefit of Signor Prospero. So, uh, sadly, uh, John Paolo was not a very good painter, it turned out. In fact, uh, he's quoted as being referred to as a countless simpleton. Uh, so he soon gave up pursuit of his own artistic career, essentially to support his wife. Um, sometimes we think that he did some of the uh, preparatory work, perhaps helping paint the, the draperies or the background details of some of Fontana's uh, pieces. Uh, but actually her primary role was that of being her agent, helping her secure commissions, not to mention help raising their 11 children. Um, so turning to what's depicted on the screen then uh, is this work. And this is um, one of the two earlier self-portraits that Fontana painted. And here we see her uh, playing the instrument that she knew very well how to play, the spinet. Um, so she is dressed in this beautiful plush red and white outfit, uh, looking directly and confidently into the eyes of the viewer. And we see uh, over her right shoulder there, uh, or left, right, left shoulder, can't, um, directions. Ah, uh, a, a woman servant opens a musical score, but it seems like Fontana doesn't need that. Uh, she knows what she's playing. Uh, you can see in the background in front of the window in the top right corner of the composition, uh, her easel is uh, there ready for her to uh, paint her next masterpiece. 
And uh, essentially, Fontana painted this work as a gift to be sent to her fiance's father, John Paolo's dad, Severo Zappi, shortly after their betrothal. So this was a form of uh, self-advertisement, not only of her skills as an artist, um, but arguably uh, of her beauty as well. Um, so uh, she's also shown playing the spinet to indicate uh, that her talents go beyond her artistry uh, in painting. Uh, furthermore, the inclusion of the servant uh, and the elegant clothing she's wearing and the lavish jewelry basically shows that she is a well-to-do young woman, right? She's a woman of high class. And you can see that her uh, dress is in red. And this was actually um, the, the favored color of wedding dresses in Bologna at that time. Um, and you can see that uh, she's also wearing a, a piece of coral. Uh, carved into the form uh, of a love knot on her chest, uh, symbolizing uh, the engagement as well. And upon receipt of the painting, uh, her father and uh, wrote back to Fontana, uh, to her dad, and said that she was not fair nor ugly, but just in the middle, as women have to be, uh, which I think is a bit unfair. Uh, but but uh, I guess at least he didn't call her ugly. So I think it'd be interesting to, to pause a moment and we were just talking about Sofonisba uh, and compare this earlier self-portrait by Fontana um, to a similar, very similar one, I think, by uh, Anguissola, uh, another super famous uh, woman painter from early modern Italy. And I'd like to ask you all, how do these paintings seem to advertise uh, the talent or virtue of each of these artists? And how might we see their agency being conveyed in these works? If, if I may, what wifted women? I mean, you are talking about talents and virtue, but uh, they they would they were able not only to uh, have eleven children and and also a husband who was also painter with the natural competition as part of the relationship in, in the marriage. But also uh -huh. a, a father teacher and, and, and living with his teachings, and also they were able to play uh, music instruments. And oh my gosh, what gifted women at this point! So both talented and virtuoso. Yes, definitely. Um, this is a way of showing off more than their beauty, right? Considering they're the ones that uh, painted these compositions, um, capturing uh, essentially their loveliness uh, for their viewers. But beyond showing their beauty, I think it is more so advertising their skills, right? Not only in painting, but in, in the musical arts, showing that they're more than just a pretty face, I like to think. Um, even though the work on the left was for her betrothal, it shows, I think, that uh, Lavinia has a sense of agency. Um, she's a, a strong figure, right? She's uh, meeting the gaze of the viewer, um, kind of sizing us up equally. She's not averting um, her gaze, just like Sofonisba. And I think there's a, a sense of strength in that positioning of these figures. But I, if, if anyone has any comments I, or questions, I'd love to hear. No comments. Okay, I perfect. Everyone agrees with you. Okay, great. Yeah, that, that sounds good to me. Uh, I'm going to keep going then because I know I'm, I'm not going to have enough time to discuss everything. So around this time, uh, just pr uh, after getting married, uh, Lavinia created this devotional piece, uh, The Holy Family with Saints Margaret. You can see her in the lower left with her pet dragon. Uh, I don't know if it's a pet, but that's maybe not the best word, but uh, her uh, saintly attribute. And uh, St. Francis is right behind her. And this was painted in 1578, just as her career was taking off. And indeed, the, the painting uh, is essentially... Uh, uh, of uh, a devotional work that captures uh, essentially the Madonna and child uh, with Joseph uh, in this very intimate domestic scene. So Christ is being very carefully cradled by his mother uh, and behind them, uh, Joseph kind of looks on. And to the left, we see St. Margaret with her dragon and St. Francis who are bowing their heads in a gesture of worship uh, to the Christ child. Uh, it seems as though Mary and Margaret are uh, closer to uh, Christ 
and seem to be caught up in this moment of bliss, right? The the newborn Messiah is here and are, uh, you know, kind of uh, very happy to be in the present moment. Um, and this is further emphasized by the very ni nice, soft, uh, natural lighting that uh, Fontana uses to um, soften these figures. However, I would say the background's a little darker and standing back in the shadows, Joseph and Francis appear slightly um, less moved by the scene of maternal bliss. And I think that's because they're not contemplating this uh, present moment alone, right? They're also considering Christ's future, uh, the day of Christ's crucifixion. Um, one scholar at uh, Margaret A. Samu suggests that Fontana's merging of these signs of birth, death, and the resurrection of Christ may reflect her contemplation of her own recent birth and sadly subsequent death of her firstborn child uh, in the year just prior to painting this. Uh, and I should note that um, of all of her 11 pregnancies, only three of her children outlived her. So um, many of them uh, passed away prior, uh, a few at birth as well. It was it was hard work um, <laughs> bearing a child and very dangerous for the mother and child. Okay. I, I, was, I was thinking about that and a couple of things. First of all, uh, a mother of 11, uh, I think this, this motherhood scenes from women painters, usually they, they have this uh, ex strange quality of, of appreciating motherhood in a very different manner than, than men. I mean, just yeah. the gesture of the uh, uh, left hand with the uh, left leg of Christ this is uh, a very interesting way of, of holding the baby. And, and second one, is, uh, I see a kind of uh, something from Garcino and Domenichino in, in, in this painting, in this particular painting, especially the greens and the, and the pinks. And uh -huh. I, I, I was curious to know how important were Lavinia's relationships with other painters at this point, other than her father and her husband, uh, I mean, this is a very early moment of, of Lavinia's career. So right. she, she wasn't able yet to know people like Domenichino or Gercino or right. even Guido. Uh, but uh, it, it, it would be interesting to know if, if at this early stage of her career, she was able to know other painters painting and, and, and incorporating these yeah, definitely. her own painting. I think her largest source would have been her father's workshop, right? Um, so not only this, what her father was producing, but those who were training under him. So those were really her her main influencers, I, I would say. So like the Bolognese painters of the late Cinquecento. Um, she kind of develops into her own style. Um, some scholars have argued she has some kind of uh, mannerist tendencies uh, in her compositions. Um, and that makes sense. Like uh, Prospero was working alongside Giorgio Fasari, Prino del Vaga, who probably influenced his art. So he brought that back to Bologna with him and um, which I think further influenced Fontana's art. Um, but this is quite different um, than what we'll see uh, her making later on in her career. But she's, she's really impressive in terms of like her artworks, you can tell some things by her, but her style really varies. Uh, she can do a lot of interesting stuff in her art, I think. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's go ahead and look at a portrait by Fontana, because actually this is arguably the genre she is best known for. So by the early 1580s, Fontana was really highly sought after by all the Bolognese nobility and uh, for classes, anyone who could afford a painting by her, really. And early on in her career, she was earning impressive figures uh, for her portraiture. And she was known to have especially close and warm relationships with her uh, female sitters, especially. Uh, indeed, the Duchess uh, Sora Costanza Sforza von Campagni um, basically became uh, one of her big patrons and was uh, a godmother of some of Lavinia's own kids. 
Um, so it seems like the the women really wanted to be portrayed by Fontana. Uh, they felt a bit more at ease with her as a, a woman artist. So in this work, we see a uh, portrait of a noble woman. Uh, it's an unidentified lady. Some argue it could be uh, Livia de' Medici Bandini. Um, but regardless, she's in this beautiful, sumptuous red dress, uh, perhaps a, a wedding dress because of the color red there, uh, and has this ornate jewelry. And she is shown in three quarters length, uh, standing against this nice uh, dark uh, background and petting a, a little cute uh, spaniel with her right hand. I always love it when dogs make it into portraits. Uh, so the brown and white dog stands on its hind legs on this wooden table with its front paws upon the woman's skirt. Uh, meanwhile, the woman gazes fixedly off uh, to the left side of the frame. She is not meeting our gaze, interestingly enough. Uh, in addition to her regular jewelry, she also wears uh, around her waist this uh, belt. I don't know if you can see my mouse on the screen or not. Maybe, maybe this is in vain. <laughs> yeah. no, okay. No, no. It's, it's perfectly okay. Our screen is quite big. Okay, perfect. Yeah, it's probably bigger than my 8 by 10 inch screen. I'm pretty sure. Okay, uh, yes, yeah. so she, she's wearing this uh, cord, which hangs this fine jeweled item. And we think that's either a, a jar to hold perfume, perhaps to ward off fleas. Um, it can get quite hot in Bologna in the summer, uh, or uh, a bejeweled pelt of a marten, which is a small, very coveted type of uh, a weasel, like a mink, essentially, um, that's uh, already uh, deceased, obviously. Uh, but this painting is essentially a, a really great example of her portraiture. She was known to really depict exquisite clothing and jewels in fine detail, uh, showing off not only the nobility of her sitters, but also uh, their wealth and status. And like I said, we can probably surmise that this was a betrothal or wedding portrait, as red was the typical color of Bolognese uh, wedding dresses. And dogs are often served as symbols of marital fidelity. Uh, any questions on this work before I show you a couple more? Esta pregunta: Mujeres siendo pintadas por mujeres, sino por hombres, diciéndole a otra mujer lo que le gustaría. Esa es una pregunta interesante. Como um, I, I, I was sorry, I, I, I yeah, changed to Spanish. I, I was thinking in, in, in women being painted by other women. And and the fact that uh, the that that was not very likely in, in at that time. I mean, if, yeah. if a woman was eager to have uh, her own painting for for a marriage or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. they, they usually rely in, in male painters. So uh, when speaking with uh, Lavinia, they were able to tell women to women uh, about her desire or, or expectations or, or the way they they were trying to highlight, I don't know, maybe uh, the clothing or the jewelry or yeah. anything else related to her female condition with another woman painter. And, and, and I think that that's quite provocative in the, in the sense of how women painters were able to uh, better understand their wishes yeah. for women. Yeah, definitely. And like as a woman myself, like I think I like if I were to get my portrait painted, I would I would prefer <laughs> a woman artist, you know, to capture me. Uh, I I think that it's just it's more it was more comfortable for the women, like you said, right? Um, apparently she, she liked to have conversations with her sitters too. So like, it was, uh, probably much different than working, uh, with a male artist, right? Um, uh, cause society kind of precluded from them interacting, um, like that just because a woman's virtue was meant to be kept ironclad shut, right? So I think women were able to let their guards down. Um, when Lavinia Fontana came to paint them, uh, they didn't have to worry about those societal prescriptions, right? Um, so they could be perhaps a little uh, less uh, at uh, on edge. And at this point, I'm feeling a little bit uncomfortable because I'm not part of this sorority. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay, uh, and I just wanted yeah. to show you. Uh, a question. If, if we may, question. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Yes, please. I'm a good one. Okay, I don't know if I'm correct. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, but she looks um, 
so much more powerful than other noble women portrayed in Renaissance painting, paintings. Um, but she's also delicate. The way she is uh, petting her dog is mm -hmm. it's beautiful. And it's like this conjunction of mm -hmm. two aspects that are rarely uh, together in, in female uh, representation. Um, there is uh, like um, the fact that she's taking care of someone, a dog, mm -hmm. but yeah. she's very, very powerful. I mean, yes. her, and this is a marriage portrait. The, the fact that she looks so powerful in, in a context in which she's been um getting married, she's getting married. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's kind of frightening for the husband. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, perhaps. Uh, but I guess Bologna was like we, we were saying, uh, maybe a little bit more of a, a liberal place, uh, yeah. a little more open minded, uh, where women could uh, attend classes like at the university that wasn't happening throughout the rest of the Italian peninsula. Um, women had a, a little bit greater sense of agency. So I think that uh, portraits like this were uh, acceptable, at least in Bologna. Um, but I do think that because a woman artist painted this, I would agree that she gives uh, this the sitter, whoever she is, perhaps Olivia, uh, a sense of uh, power, right? She's standing tall and firm and uh, shows that she can, you know, take care of those surrounding her, but also has a sense of authority about her, um, I feel like. Even, uh, she, today, even today, Bologna is the most Probably. liberal and communist city in, in Italy. And, and, and yeah. That in the same in, in uh, 15th and 16th centuries. It's it's a very liberal city, mainly because of the university. The university I think so. The yeah. Alma Mater is the oldest university all over Europe. And, yes. and that, that makes a lot of sense because uh, Renaissance families, especially the Bentibobios, which was the most important family in, in 15th and 16th century, was also very concerned about their women. The, mm -hmm. uh, women had a lot of agency, uh, they were very empowered, actually. And, and that's probably because of the nature of the city. Sophia. I have a question on the perception the others had on a female artist with such power yeah. of representing others, mostly because of how Artemisia Gentileschi was so rejected until, or, well, not rejected, but she wasn't. Yeah, she was very criticized, and then she had like this outing window after the rape and the abuse and the yeah. quizio? Yes. And mm -hmm. The trial. And yes. well, I find it really not weird, but I had like this really big curiosity on how she was perceived and criticized or acclaimed, or what was the public's response. Yeah, definitely. So I think Fontana, like for one, uh, while she lived in Bologna, which as we know was a more liberal place, uh, people were more accepting of her uh, being a working artist at this time. Uh, there were earlier women artists in Bologna working, but none is like, uh, you know, acclaimed or as uh, famous as Fontana. Uh, but I think that it was really smart that her husband, her father had her marry at a younger age because uh, mostly men were concerned about women's chastity at this period. That that's what they were ultimately obsessed with. Like, is, a, is this woman pure sexually or not? And because she married just prior to her career kind of springing off, I think that kind of protected her virtue. Um, and she always had to be very careful about, you know, maintaining uh, herself and uh, working with her patrons. Uh, and she was very strategic, I think, in who she commissioned. Uh, she got uh, commissions from as well. I would say that in terms of like her public reception on like a, a broader scale, uh, most people, uh, most art critics of the 17th century, uh, like Mancini, uh, Bellori, uh, I can't think of his name. He wrote the Felsina Petrice. Oh my gosh, Malvasia. Uh, uh, they they all, 
Yes, they were all very impressed with her work. Um, sometimes they were a little degrading when it came to uh, genres that she was working in outside of portraiture. Um, she got some disses from her like big history paintings, her larger devotional pieces, because that's not really a genre yet that was deemed as proper for women to paint within. Uh, but in terms of like her portraits, like they they nothing but praise. Um, so as long as she was working within these social boundaries of her gender, I feel like people were pretty respectable uh, to her. It was in those moments when she tried to kind of step outside and paint things that are a little maybe more risque that she got a little um, feedback, negative feedback from. Okay. If that, hopefully that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Now that you're talking about the themes that um, it was common painting, I noticed that some or a lot of painting of women painting um, painted the Judith with the head of uh -huh. yeah. And I wanted to ask if that's like uh, first of all if that was like a feminist um, act, and second of all. How do other painters, especially men, men painters, saw that? Like it was good. Yeah, that's that's a good question. So I'm actually not really going to talk about that work, but I did have it on uh, my like title slide here uh, because I love it. Um, and yeah, this was a really popular subject, uh, it seems, for uh, women artists to depict. Um, and I think it's because it's a strong, you know, female heroine um, that is praised, right, for her, her valor and virtue for having uh, basically defeated Holofernes, right, and helping, you know, uh, her Jewish people escape that plight. Um, so for women artists, this was uh, a really powerful role model, I think, for um, them to uh, depict and kind of look up to and for other women viewers to look up to. And I think there was probably some anxiety for male viewers when they saw pieces like this, because oh, yeah. like literally, right, it's a woman holding a guy's head decapitated. Uh, they probably felt a little emasculated. Um, but uh, at the same time, because of her her moral virtue, being known as this is this pious Jewish widow, I think this was seen as, you know, decorous. This was okay to paint even for women artists and for women to look up to, uh, regardless of perhaps the anxiety it caused in the male gaze. And I'm sure you're familiar with Caravaggio's version of Judith and Holofernes, right? Um, which is a much weaker Judith, in my opinion. She's uh, beautiful, yes, but she looks like she can't get the job done. Uh, and we know artists like Artemisia Genileschi, Lavinia Fontana, uh, and many others uh, also painted much stronger uh, and valiant Judas, which I think that they would have looked up to. Um, like if I got to commission a history painting and was a 16th century lady, I would I would commission a <laughs> Judith and Holofernes. Yeah, definitely. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, it is. Thank you. Yeah. I'll go back to where I was. Was I there? No, I was right there. Okay, uh, I'll, I'm gonna keep moving. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna keep talking about these uh, works for like the next half hour or so. And by 11.15, I might jump ahead to uh, my own research, which I'm really excited to share with you, but we'll see what I can uh, cover in the next half hour or so. If we get through it, uh, we'll see. Okay. So uh, I now want to look at another of her slightly earlier work, uh, her Nulli uh from 1581. This is another uh, religious painting. So we see in the foreground of this work, this is the moment uh, after Christ has uh, essentially been resurrected from his tomb. He was, you know, dead for three days after the crucifixion, and now he is arisen. And uh, we see Mary Magdalene in this beautiful uh like sherbet orange and pink uh, outfit, um, essentially encountering the resurrected Christ in a garden. And for some reason, Christ is wearing this <laughs> garden hat uh, and she mistakes him, rightly so, for a gardener, right? Christ has, had, she saw him die on the cross, helped him get buried, uh, didn't know what was going on. However, upon realizing his true identity, uh, she essentially is shocked, right? And she reaches out to him in disbelief. And he tells her, Noli me tangere, touch me not, um, which is the title of the work in Latin. 
So Fontana made the unusual choice here uh, to depict Christ as uh, literally a contemporary looking uh, gardener. Uh, he's given this wide brim straw hat, a simple tunic. Uh, he's, he doesn't even have shoes on and a spade. So like even to us as viewers for a second, we question like, is this Christ? Uh, and he's reaching his hand out over Mary Magdalene's head. And to me, it seems more or less of like a no, 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 don't touch me. And more so of like a blessing, like touch me not. But thanks for, you know, recognizing me and following me and being so devoted to me. And uh, what's also interesting about this uh, painting is its background, um, which we actually see uh, uh, what happens in this moment before uh, the Magdalene sees Christ. And we see uh, essentially Mary Magdalene uh, with the Virgin Mary, uh, so many Marys in the Bible. Uh, Christ's mother is right behind her. And you can see that she's really upset. She's got her hand over her face. She's weeping because she's visiting her dead son. And they walk to his tomb and they see that uh, essentially the stone that was you know, placed over it is gone now all of a sudden. And there is a glowing angel inside of the space. And basically the angel tells them that oh, Christ, Christ has been resurrected. You know, he, his body is no longer here. So uh, this is interesting because this precedes that uh, foreground narrative of, you know, Christ is risen from the dead. So it gives this painting a little more context. Uh, so I think this work also kind of demonstrates some of that mannerist tendencies that Fontana painted with earlier in her career, those use of uh, vivid colors as in that orange and peak in the Magdalene's robes. Um, the bodies are somewhat elongated and uh, contorted, um, placed in these nice curving poses that is meant to show uh, a, like a sense of elegance uh, to these paintings. So I, I think this really bears uh, for an interesting comparison to a, another Noli Me Tangere painted about, what, 75 years prior um, by a Venetian artist, uh, Titian. And I'd like to ask you, how does a woman artist version of the subject differ from a, a man's, perhaps? And why do you think that might be the case? I don't know if I have a correct point of view. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, but there is, I've noticed that the, when she portrays um, women of uh, religious uh, tradition, um, they are highlighted with such a light. It, it, it was the same, um, it was the same thing with the Virgin Mary and Saint Margaret. There is a light uh, that focuses on them, and I don't think I've ever seen um, um, a religious woman, especially uh, Mary Magdalene, portrayed in such light and in such dignity. She looks like a princess, and yeah. she looks, <laughs> looks just like a gardener. Mm -hmm. she seems like she's the, um, the principal character of this painting. Um, and, and I just think that's uh, really beautiful because always uh, the men behind their story mm -hmm. are like behind them and uh, have like a second place in, in, in these paintings. And I think that's beautiful. Yeah, I would 100% agree with that. Like, regardless of her, like, bending down in supplication to Christ, I still think that she is the protagonist of the painting. I would agree. Um, there's a sense of, like, gravity and respect that Fontana gives her um, that I think Titian is not as kind. And it's funny because Titian is known as this great lover of women and uh, very respectable to women and uh, paints them a lot in their compositions. But to me, in his uh, Noli Me Tangere, she's almost groveling at his feet, right? Uh, and even though uh, Lavinia has her Magdalene kneeling, it, to me, it doesn't seem as denigrating. I don't know, maybe oh. this is my feminist tendencies, re you know, psychoanalyzing this painting, but. I don't know. What do you, what any other thoughts? I think I agree with you on the denigration. I I, I hadn't found the word, wow. but in most of Noli Mitangere representations by men, 
it's as if she's begging and he's saying no no and here she's not necessarily begging like there's a little more of a dignity in her asking for it <laughs> yeah definitely it's almost like she's like in this moment realizing this is christ the messiah so she's kind of like awestruck um mm -hmm. but that doesn't make her seem like less than uh yeah. there's still a sense of uh her her strength i think and Christ seems, I think, more so like less, no, 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 naughty Mary Magdalene, you know, uh, like, you know, like he's actively pulling away in Titian's composition. He's grabbing his drapery um, and he doesn't look anything like a gardener. So it makes Mary Magdalene appear a bit like an idiot as well. <laughs> like, yeah. you don't recognize that as Christ. Like he's even in his, you know, the, the clothes from the resurrection. So I think uh, Lavinia Fontana makes uh, a much more convincing painting showing how she did mistake him for a gardener uh, and that anyone would have made that mistake. Uh, any other? Yeah, I, 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 would love, I would love to know more about the uh, religious context of Bologna and, and Venice in, in 1514 and in 1581, respectively. Because in, in my opinion, uh, Lavinia's <laughs> looks very conservative in many ways in the way that the story is being told. Uh, I mean, Tizian's Christ is almost naked, and 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 the sexual content of of, of these stories is uh, it's all over the place. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, it, it's quite powerful, but at the same time, it's, it's quite yeah. At any rate, I... as, as Sofia was talking, but uh -huh. at, the same, at the same time, Lavinia's. For me, it looks very, very conservative. I, I mean, I, I, I would love to know the uh, the religious ambience in, in Bologna in the 80s, but... Uh, yes. So, that, one thing to for, know... Yeah, that's important painting. I mean, it's a yeah. very conservative painting and also very respectful with, uh, with the women uh -huh. here. So, uh, Titian was painting his just prior to um, this big you know, religious moment of the Reformation, yeah. counter-Reformation happening. And I think um, Lavinia Fontana is working in counter-Reformation Bologna. In fact, where uh, one of like the biggest counter-Reformation authors of the period, uh, Paleotti, uh, was like giving lectures in Bologna at this time, and he actually knew Fontana. So I think the conservative elements that you're picking up on here, like uh, how Christ is fully clothed, and uh, you don't see See, you do, there's no really a uh, sense of eroticism in her work. It's for one, because I think again of her gender, right? She can't get away with this much uh, early on in her career. And second, because of uh, the counter-reformation and how um, essentially the Catholic church was cracking down on these types of erotic or uh, strange religious works that um, aren't as, you know, straightforward or, you um, you know, as, as close to the Bible as they should be. So yeah, um, by that, the time that, that, Fontana's painting, you know, she's got to adhere to that stuff. Yeah, that's the word. Titian's work is very straightforward. <laughs> yeah. Well, to be fair, yeah, this is uh, not too crazy of a, a, of a, a religious painting on the left. Um, the Christ figure is very interesting, though. Like you said, he he you could read him as uh, eroticized, right? He's barely wearing any clothing. His his drapery kind of bunches up uh, right around his genitalia, which uh, I know Leo Steinberg has said a lot about. Absolutely, Steinberg yeah. would love to talk about that. Oh gosh, that's for another day. Absolutely. Yeah, but I think yeah, like. I, I would agree. Uh, she's definitely, her work is conservative in a lot of ways, uh, except perhaps for how she gives a sense of strength to her 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 women uh, figures um, that I think is really unprecedented um, and could be prescribed largely to her gender, why she's reacting as such. Any other questions? I think we're fine. Okay, cool. Uh, I want to show you a couple more portraits then um, before we uh, move onward. Um, so for about 20 years, beginning in the 1580s, Fontana became essentially the portraitist of choice among uh, Bolognese noblewomen and uh, uh, many other uh, Bolognese um, clients. 
He also painted the likeness of several important individuals connected through the University of Bologna. So um, what I'm showing you here are two slightly ex uh, later examples of her portraits from the mid 1590s. Uh, uh, perhaps a more typical example on the right and a slightly unusual one uh, perhaps on the left. And I'll, I'll speak a little to this painting on the left here. Uh, and this one depicts Anton Antonietta Gonzalez. And she was actually a young girl from the Canary Islands who along with several of her family members, uh, including her father, uh, Petrus Gonzalez, uh, suffered from a rare genetic condition known as hypertrichosis, uh, more commonly, I think, known to us today as werewolf syndrome. And this condition resulted in the growth of essentially excessive hair all over her, her body uh, and face. And at this time, actually, uh, hypertrichosis was either viewed as a, a sort of like divine gift. This is God like singling you out to be special or something of a uh, scientific curiosity, perhaps, or um, um, perhaps a, a demonic curse. So there was a really uh, range in acceptability of, of this uh, sort of scientific uh, situation. So Antonietta and her family were welcomed members in European courts because of their unusual likenesses. Um, but I think that Fontana paints this girl, who we think she was around 10 years old when this was created, uh, with kind of a sweet, childlike expression. She's gazing out uh, amicably at the viewer uh, in our direction while holding to her chest a, a piece of paper that explains uh, some of her personal history. Uh, and one historian, uh, Mary Weisner Hanks, explains how Fontana met this young girl in Parma, so uh, not too far away from Bologna where essentially this young girl and her family were members of the court of Lady Isabella Pallavicino, um, who was a Marchesa there. They were basically hosting this family there. And I think this portrait really exemplifies Fontana's ability to convey a sense of tenderness in her sitters, no matter how they, they physically appear. Uh, it's a portrait uh, with a high level of emotional involvement, and it indicates a strong sense of familiarity between the sitter and the artist. And uh, some scholars have argued even it's possible that as, you know, women painters were in and of themselves a sort of rarity at the time, that uh, Fontana might have sort of bonded with this young girl in the sense that they were both kind of uh, outsiders. Um, but on the right, meanwhile, is a more typical portrait uh, by uh, Fontana. And this is one we do know who it depicts, uh, Costanza Alidosi. And I actually just saw this work for the first time in person a few months ago uh, at a really great exhibition in Baltimore. It's right, uh, it's in Toronto right now. Um, but I highly recommend uh, checking out this catalog uh, on Making Her Mark. Uh, it's a history of early modern women artists uh, in uh mostly in Europe or in North America from about 1400 to 1800. It's a really great exhibition, great catalog. Uh, at any yeah, rate- the exhibition, uh, the exhibition was outstanding. I, I loved it. Did you see it? And, and back, I wasn't able to take the catalog. Oh, oh, it's it's worth buying. Uh, it's it's not too expensive either. Um, and there's some really great essays in there by uh, the curators who exhibited the show and some like uh, scholars like Babette Bone uh, talks about some of like the jewelry and clothing that Lavinia paints. I forget who else wrote essays in there, but definitely worth uh, checking out if you're interested and women artists. And what's really great, this is me going off topic now, but like a number of the artists they look at are actually anonymous women, which uh, is kind of nice to shine a light on these, uh, you know, voices we will never perhaps know their names, um, but their work um, is being, you know, evaluated and uh, is worthy of scholarly study, which I think is really important. Um, uh, work was amazing. Yes. Yeah, I would. I want to go to Toronto just to see the the exhibition again. It was so great. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the the woman on the right is Costanza Aladosi, and uh, another of these Bolognese uh, noble ladies, and she's depicted in a sparsely uh, but somewhat still like we can tell she has money, right? Uh, luxurious 
uh, interior. Uh, in the upper left, we can see out a window uh, a, the, a courtyard and two open doorways are just visible, uh, giving the painting a little greater sense of depth and perspective. Um, and the life-size figure, this is a pretty big painting, of Aladosi occupies the entire height of the painting, which again, I think gives her a sort of uh, prominence, agency that uh, male artists were perhaps less want to do in their portraits of women. Uh, Fontana also angles Aladosi's body towards the viewer, uh, giving the portrait a sense of intimacy as well, like uh, she's engaged in conversation with us. It almost reminds me a little bit of the Mona Lisa uh, leaning in her chair, right, towards the viewer assessing us. Um, so Fontana obviously at this point is known for her abilities in rendering fabrics and jewelries and, and is definitely showing off in this painting, capturing her dress and her jewels meticulously, uh, particularly the details of the gold embroidery on the skirt and bodice. And I can say in, in person, it is masterful. You want to reach out and like touch it because it looks so lifelike. Um, and you can even see like the texture of the red chair as well, the velvet uh, that like, I wanna put my fingers on it as well as Aladosi is uh, resting her hand there. So uh, Aladosi, this was not a marriage portrait. She was actually married, uh, what, 20 years prior in 1571 to a nobleman. Um, but he was a senator and associate of the Medici family in Florence. So he was often uh, away from home, leaving his wife essentially to attend to the family's business. So this is another uh, powerful female figure uh, in Bologna. And it was most likely during one of these absences, we think that Aladosi commissioned Fontana to paint her portrait, uh, possibly, uh, most likely, I think, as a display of her own power and autonomy. Um, and her husband is kind of referenced obliquely here. Um, perhaps the dog on her lap might reference her, her husband who's away perhaps in Florence on business. Um, there's also some juniper uh, um, uh, blossoms tucked into her bodice, which also symbolizes uh, her fidelity to her husband, uh, even though he's far uh, absent from her sight. So I'd like to ask, looking at these paintings, how do you think, uh, how do you think Fontana was in her ability to capture their likeness? And do you think that um, beyond capturing, I don't know, their um, either peculiarities or beauty, you think that she has the ability to capture their personality as well? And how does it come across, I suppose? I, I feel like, especially the portrait of Antonieta, I love how she portrays her. And I was thinking that I feel that if a man had um, okay. represented her, it would have been more of an exaltation mm -hmm. than a representation with dignity and respect. <laughs> and I feel like I'm also falling into my feminist tendencies of <laughs> saying that yeah. I would have portrayed her with the same dignity that um, Lavinia Fontana represented her and I feel like um her even her her gaze her eyes are represented with a, a very light stroke that gives her a lot of dignity mm -hmm. yeah I would agree with that. she's not trying to demonize her or belittle her in this portrait this is a portrait uh, of an innocent girl who um, has to be quite brave, right? She left her hometown in, you know, the Canary Islands and went all the way to Parma, Italy with her family um, to be, um, honestly, a sort of court curiosity. Um, yeah. So she did not live an easy life. Um, uh, regardless, I think Fontana, I think, was uh, kind of developed a, a, a friendship with this young girl. Um, and we remember Fontana at this point has had, you know, half a dozen children, uh, if, if not more. And so is very good with kids. And I think that uh, she was able to kind of um, get to know Antonietta and capture her, 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 her sense of agency, uh, even as a young child. She's given a sense of dignity, I would agree, that um, I don't know a male artist could have equaled. I, uh, the, I I was thinking that even Rivera or, or Velázquez couldn't escape the uh, uh, 
medical or natural implications of this kind of uh, genetic alterations or uh, like enanism or, or things like that. Uh -huh. uh, these, these characters in the European courts. And, and uh, on the other hand, uh, Lavinia is able to deal with that in a very human fashion. It, it's mm -hmm. it like uh, she knew her very well and, and they they got to know each other and they yeah. had some kind of, of uh, mutual knowledge. Uh, it, it's it's quite funny. On the other hand, the portrait of Palidosi uh, is, is one of my favorites. I, I'm pretty sure you know the books of uh, Adelina Modesti. And and I, yes. was, I was I was with Adelina once and, and we were looking to this particular painting and Adelina said it, it's one of my favorites, my absolute favorites, because I can see myself into that. Mm. I think that's uh, that's something quite important to say when, when you yeah. are doing a, a woman portrait painted by a woman artist. Yeah, definitely. I would agree. That there's a there's a sense of I think that Costanza is acknowledging Lavinia as Lavinia is painting Costanza and acknowledging her own agency. There is a sense of mutual respect that yeah. Lavinia has between her sitters that I think comes across in her portraits that uh, strengthen them. Yeah, indubitably. Yeah. Okay. Quickly, I would like to comment on the fact that um, this is probably the first painting, if not the only that I've seen in which a child is portrayed like a child. Now, like yes. a mini adult. <laughs> and the right. fact, I also think that the fact that she's a little girl holding uh, a paper telling her story, it's a very powerful act. I mean, if, if women had no chance to tell their story, um, girls had less of a, of a right yeah. Yeah. And this is a little girl with a genetic condition. Um, mm -hmm. It could have been portrayed uh, as something funny or humiliating. Mm -hmm. Definitely. She's so yeah. just telling her story, and it's very pretty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I think that having her own children kind of helped Lavinia. Uh, I don't have too many other portraits of, uh, oh, there is one more that we're gonna look at uh, of a woman with her, some of her, six of her children, um, but she is really good at capturing uh, the likenesses of children and the spirit of children, right? Um, and I think that being a mother kind of, um, kind of helps, you know, like raising children yourself and being around them constantly um, kind of allows you as well to better interact with your sitters and portray them in their own likeness rather than try and make them look like little adults, um, which is maybe cute in its own way, but less lifelike, right? And that's like, you know, in portraiture, you want to capture a sense of the personhood to make it a good portrait. So yeah, I would agree. Any other thoughts? I think we're fine. Okay, cool. Uh, just keeping an eye on the time here. Um, I'll, I'll keep going. Uh, oh, okay. that! Oh, that one is wonderful. I I, right? I saw it in, the, in Dublin, and it's a wonderful. Uh, I'm so I was so sad. So there was a big Lavinia Fontana show in Dublin. Was it last year? Yep. Yeah, and I, I just more, put... but before that, a couple of years ago, they. Put the whole painting in a in a in a room just by itself wow. because of the restoration and they have the uh the drawings and stuff. It, it was fantastic because it's so huge. It and, is. It's big. Uh, the dog the dog is wonderful. I, uh, I don't have the dimensions of the 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 I, I think it's more here, than but... eight meters or so. It's two hundred and seventy-six by three hundred and twenty-five centimeters. Oh gosh. Yeah, I don't know the <laughs> it's it's big. Um I know so before I was even familiar with Lavinia's paintings, I, I I was never taught actually Lavinia's art in in any class that I took. 
um, throughout college and grad school. So it was just me uh, going to Bologna. I don't remember why I was there, but I went to the Pinacoteca uh, where oh. a lot of her paintings were are on display still since you know she lived most of her life there. And that's how I found out about her. I'm like, why, why are we not, you know, uh, looking into this artist? How have I not learned about her in the classroom? And this was like, I don't know, six years ago that this happened. And there, there, there have been strides just in the last six years of uh, sc increased scholarship on women artists, but there's still lots to do. So, okay. Uh, so while receiving commissions and actively working uh, up until the end of the century, Fontana eventually uh, returned to Rome in the Jubilee year of 1600. She'd gone a couple times prior and actually received a commission to paint an altarpiece for a Dominican chapel uh, built in honor of St. Hyacinth of Poland. Uh, this work is not on the screen um, because it is no longer extant, but this was really a moment of triumph in her career. Um, Lavinia had successfully broken through the bastions of Rome's artistic boys club, as we were talking about uh, at the beginning of this class, uh, to leave her mark in one of its oldest and most venerated churches. And right around this time, she also painted this massive group portrait, uh, which I find more impressive anyway, uh, the visit of the Queen of Sheba to King Solomon, so to speak. Um, so this painting was the first work by a woman old master um, that was knowingly acquired by the National Gallery of Ireland, uh, where it still resides today. Apparently it has its own gallery room. That's pretty cool. Uh, and extraordinary detailed and widely recognized as probably one of the most ambitious compositions that Fontana ever painted. Uh, this monumental canvas measures, yes, at more uh, about three uh, meters. Uh, in in width, so uh, pretty big. So the subject of this painting is made clear, in fact, uh, uh, essentially by an inscription in the bottom left that you can barely make out on the step, but this identifies uh, the scene uh, allegorically as the meeting of King Solomon with the Queen of Sheba. These were two great uh, biblical rulers described in the Old uh, Testament. Uh, if you're familiar with King Solomon, the son of David, he was one of these Old Testament kings. Uh, though Fontana here is quoting directly from that Old Testament book, visually, uh, we are not seeing a biblical uh, scene here, right? This is this does not look like uh, an Old Testament uh, image. And that's because, uh, you know, it is not really technically a biblical narrative painting, but a series of portraits depicting members of a 16th century Italian court. And of course, um, we know this because for one, their clothing and coiffures, their hairstyles, all of this relate to the fashions of uh, late 16th, early 17th century Amelia. Uh, we can see there's a, a little person here in the foreground along with a hunting dog. These are two big hallmarks of the Italian Renaissance court. Um, we can also see that there's gifts being uh, carried uh, by uh, this page here um, that appear to be uh, luxuries uh, that would have been given to a 16th century uh, bride even on, uh, in her trousseau. And the painting has been described by scholars uh, since the turn of the 18th century as an allegorical portrait uh, representing these real life uh, court members. And prior to the in-depth research carried out on this painting, um, it was just recently conservated as uh, Dr. Christ has said, uh, Sheba and Solomon were first identified unanimously as the Duke and Duchess of Mantua. Um, um, this is no longer believed to be the case anymore, uh, but uh, rather we think instead it depicts the Duke and Duchess of Ferrara, which is uh, right by Mantua, uh, Alfonso II d'Este and his wife Margarita Gonzaga. And if this is a, a painting of these two figures, um, uh, it 
makes sense that uh, we don't understand why there's no like really records of this um, commission going through because right around the time that this was painted, Alfonso died uh, without an heir. And uh, after that, the Duchy of Ferrara actually collapsed. So <laughs> the, this large canvas kind of became uh, defunct in its political, um, you know, meaning, which uh, what a bummer for Lavinia. But still, I think that others uh, still regardless read it as a, a masterpiece. Um, um, one of her, her top compositions in terms of her execution and just the size of it. Any questions on this work? Yeah, I was I was talking to Monse about the different lights in the faces of men and women. I mean, yeah, all, all men are, are kind of darkness. In, in uh -huh. the day, and in, they are also in in a corner, and women are literally glowing. I mean, it's it's so yeah. much of the light. Uh, actually, the light is coming out from the faces of you know, of all women and. and Men are completely dark. It's, it's wonderful. Uh -huh. Yeah. I like you might be able to say, oh, that was, you know, just happenstance. But I do think that uh, Lavinia probably wanted to showcase these women, uh, you know, and give them a sense of agency, um, show off their wealth and status by these beautiful gowns that they're dressed in, like their lace collars, their their high uh, <laughs> hairdos atop their head. It's it's pretty um, impressive. And I would probably argue she was more comfortable painting women than men. So um, maybe from a technical uh, uh, perspective, perhaps they're placed in shadow um, because she's less comfortable uh, rendering them. You could argue that. Um, but from a feminist perspective, uh, you could, uh, I think, argue otherwise, right? And think that, okay, let's put the spotlight on these women um, and show their importance in this large allegorical portrait. I think she's is very proficient in painting men. I, mean, uh, I agree. She, she has no problem at all. I mean, I, I like very much the face of King Solomon. And, and yes. But on the other hand, she's, uh, he looks to me very comfortable painting women. And, and the, uh, the portrait gallery, which is actually the, the centerpiece of the, of the painting, is, uh, it's a proof of that. Yeah. And I would agree. Like, I think she renders men just fine. Um, and you might argue that it's more a misogynist that might argue as such. Um, so I, I, yeah, the, the Solomon, uh, if this is um, the, the, the previous uh, Duke of Ferrara and his wife, I, I don't know. But I think, yes, she had equal um, aptitude in rendering both figures. Um, but women are certainly more so on display. They're taking up half the composition here. And I think they're more interesting to look at, right? In terms of like what they're wearing. Um, yeah. yeah, how they're positioned here. One's even holding a crown ready, um, you know. So they're they're given a spot here in court that uh, technically women in the re Italian Renaissance court were not really given as much agency. Um, you know, it was a, it was definitely a man's world in Renaissance Italy. Okay, that, so, that's an ideal, that's an ideal debate world. It represented something that that was not reality at all. Right. Yeah, a, an ideal uh, fantasy uh, in a in a perfect world, right? Uh, so I know I'm I'm already running uh, low on time, and there wasn't too much I wanted to talk about uh, past uh, my own research. I was going to talk a little bit about this group portrait, which I I love, um, of this uh, woman Bianca Delu to the Masili, uh, with her some of her children. She gave birth uh, to 19 children, and um, unfortunately uh, passed away in childbirth um, on kid 19, uh, and I don't really time really to talk about this painting so I really want to get to um just share my own research with you um but uh, I do want to kind of switch gears and talk about uh what she was doing outside of portraiture and uh religious painting because she produced quite a few images of classical uh um, mythology uh, figures for private clients. And this is like, this is the stuff I love. So this is what my research really revolves uh, around. So 
Yes, Javier? No, no, go Oh, okay. So at this point, I'm kind of going to switch gears to um, share with you stuff that I am working on, uh, part of which I uh, presented at the College Art Association meeting last month. Um, but if you have any questions or comments, feel free to interrupt me because uh, I'll be kind of going into talking mode. Uh, but I am happy to pause if you have questions. Uh, if not, I am happy to take them at the end. And even if we have extra time at the end, we can go back to that one portrait that we didn't have time to look at. Okay, so here we go, switching gears. Uh, I'll go ahead and present you uh, my own research on this painting uh, and begin uh, with a visual analysis. This is um, a, a nice way, I think, to start off just close looking at an image before we dive into um, the historical circumstances of how it was created. So within the cramped confinements of a room, we see a young adult woman standing assuredly in the nude, uh, her weight resting largely on her right leg. Turned slightly away from the beholder, the woman's body is mostly visible from the side and back, providing viewers the opportunity to appreciate the pale woman's trim figure. While much of the front of her body is occluded from our vision, this woman does turn her head towards the beholder, seemingly meeting our gaze with a slightly raised brow, perhaps an inquisition of our appearance in her private quarters. Still, this woman does not seem to mind our presence, as she does not attempt to quickly cover herself. Rather, she appears to pause in her moment of dressing, or as some have argued undressing, uh, her hand still grasping onto the silky and translucent robe, which will plausibly cover very little more of her form. Although her body is yet to be ornamented with this beautiful piece of drapery, the figure does bear a lovely coiffure topped with a delicate strand of pearls. Surrounding this female figure is an assortment of attributes that serve to associate this nude woman with the goddess of war, wisdom, and the arts, Minerva. Likewise, Minerva is equipped with her armor, shield, and helmet, the latter of which her young relative, Cupid, admires in the right side of the composition. Alongside these gleaning reflective surfaces, a velvety curtain hangs in the composition's upper left corner, thereby increasing the intimacy of the scene. In the upper right corner, situated right beyond Cupid's form, is a doorway leading outside where a staff or spear with a red tassel blocks the viewer from visually entering. Just beyond this weapon of Minerva is an owl who perches on the balustrade. The goddess's avian sidekick gazes intently towards the viewer, its yellow eyes unwavering, as we too assess the composition and gaze back. Past the feathered creature resting atop the balcony, one can make out an olive tree, the very plant that the goddess gave to the people of Athens, and the Roman temple in the far background, perhaps built in dedication to the goddess herself. In recent years, this painting of Minerva dressing, a very unusual and very rare subject to depict in post tridentine Italy, not to mention by a woman artist, has been scrutinized by several art historians. Since Paola della Pergola discovered that the work was not by a follower of Titian, as it was believed, uh, but by a woman artist, Lavinia Fontana, the work has been met with increasing interest. Following this attribution, scholars such as Cristina Herman Fiore and Liana Cheney have attempted to piece together the painting's unique iconography, um, of which I'll discuss uh, in a, just slightly uh, a little later uh, in this uh, talk. And according to recent scholarship, uh, I want to build upon these authors' publications because I, I really value uh, what they're saying in these uh, on this work. Uh, however, I want to add uh, to their knowledge and consider how women viewers, women who would have seen this work, you know, in early 17th century Italy, how they would have responded to the composition. And I would argue that Lavinia Fontana's Minerva dressing might have served as a sort of feminist statement piece for its women viewers. I believe that Fontana intentionally created this work with a specific message for female beholders, one that could easily be inferred by later generations of viewers, such as us, namely that a woman's virtue needed not be judged by her physical beauty or chastity, 
Rather, her worth might better be decided by her own creative powers and intellect. In short, by producing this work at the end of her life, literally Lavinia Fontana died a year after this. Uh, this was the last composition she created. Fontana left her beholders, perhaps, a work of art that challenged patriarchal society's expectations, or rather, limitations of women in early modern Italy. Of the few women painters working in 16th and early 17th century Italy, Lavinia Fontana was known as one of the most renowned of her female colleagues. She is known to have created over 135 paintings of various genres and sizes, both for public and private display. Indeed, Fontana was considered as an exception to her gender for her skills with her brushes and oil paint, achieving great fame even in her day and age. In general, most women painters of Cinquecento Italy learned their craft as Fontana did uh, from her relatives, as we know. And in her case, under her father, uh, she excelled first in the genre of portraiture, which was really a subject deemed as the best for women painters uh, to pursue. However, as we know, Fontana's skill with her craft ultimately led her to take on other subjects that women artists usually did not create, including private devotional pieces and public altar pieces. And indeed, to con commemorate her success as an artist at the end of her life, uh, Felice Antonio Cassoni created a portrait medal of uh, the woman artist. You can see her likeness on this side here. On the obverse of this medal, Cassini uh, cast Fontana's likeness in profile, while the reverse features a, a woman, a sort of allegorical portrait of a painter uh, with her locks of hair kind of untamed uh, as she paints upon a blank canvas before her. And you can see uh, Fontana's name is inscribed on the front side of this medal, the obverse. And on the other side here, the uh, this, this there's a, a phrase here that roughly translates to through you, i.e. painting, I remain in a joyous state. I uh, love this medal. And other artists like the fellow woman painter Sofanispa Anguissola also received similar commemoration through the creation of a medal, albeit half a century prior. Like Sofanispa's piece, Fontana's medal points to the artist's lifelong success as a painter. As noted by several scholars, Fontana was one of the first women artists to be accepted as a professional, thereby broadening the pathway for future women creators. What is more, as we know also, she was one of the first to be accepted into Rome's prestigious Academy of St. Luke. Yet of the many uh, genres that Fontana pursued throughout her artistic career, arguably the most transgressive in her day and age was her mythological paintings, particularly those featuring the nude. While the artist Minerva dressing was not her first rendition of this subject, it is arguably, I would argue, one of the most fascinating due to the painting's really unique iconography and a cheeky, no pun intended, rendering of a nude beauty. So I didn't get to this, uh, but I, uh, so I'm glad that I'm saying this here. So we know that uh, for most of her career, Lavinia Fontana worked and grew up in Bologna, uh, a sector of the Papal States at this time, and worked there for most of her career. Uh, however, the last decade of her life, she spent in Rome um, with her aging mother, uh, husband, and surviving three children. Essentially, as soon as her dad died, they were able to uh, leave Bologna and kind of start off on their own. Although the artists had met with great success in Bologna, particularly amongst the noble ladies who all desired a portrait by Fontana's hand, as Cesare Malvasia noted in his Faustina Patrice, it seems as though the death of her father prompted Lavinia and the remainder of her kin to find opportunities at the very seat of the papacy. Uh, and to be fair, that's where like the richest and most powerful uh, men in the West arguably were living. Indeed, Lavinia found great success in the Eternal City, working for esteemed patrons such as Cardinal Yerlamo Bernario, Pope Clement VIII, Pope Paul V, and the purchaser of her uh, nude Minerva, uh, uh, Cardinal Scipione Borghese. Uh, that name might ring a bell. He's most famously known, I think, as a patron of John Lorenzo uh, Bernini. And I'm showing you the his famous portrait bust by Bernini on the right. 
While scholars are on whether Scipione himself commissioned this work directly from Fontana, or whether perhaps he purchased the piece after its production, one can regardless state that the painting certainly suited the spendthrift cardinal's taste for beautiful art featuring the nude. And as the nephew of Pope Paul V, Scipione Borghese portrayed his own authority through the acquisition of several artworks and buildings throughout Rome. He ultimately became one of the largest landholders in the history of the region, according to Michael Hill. So he had a lot of money to spend. Likewise, Fontana's painting must have been a point of pride for the Borghese Cardinal to own due to the rarity of such a subject being rendered by a woman artist. Indeed, it's possible that Borghese requested a version of the subject after viewing an earlier rendition of a very similar painting by Fontana, which I'm showing you here on the right, which has just recently been redated by Patrizia Tosini and Stefania Vai um, to 1604 to 05. Um, so while the focus of this um, lecture is going to be more on Borghese's version here on the left, uh, the earlier composition, I think, merits a little further description before we return to that main case study. So thanks again to the efforts of Tosini and Vai. We now know that it was a uh, Count Marco Sitico Altemps IV who commissioned this very first painting of the goddess, um, although the work was later sold in, uh, to Count Gambra. So while initially art historians believed that this composition on the right was a recreation of Borghese's version, uh, uh, scholars found a poem printed in 1605, uh, literally titled La Palare Nuda della Famosa Petrice Lavinia Fontana. So this assuredly refuted this hypothesis. Um, and in this poem, which was written by Ottaviano Robosco, who was a member of Bologna's Accademia dei Gelati, uh, he essentially names Altemps as the patron in the poem. Like, I wish we could find more poems like this to help us <laughs> attribute works. Um, and he perhaps, I think unfairly, um, says that it is Altemps who invented the subject of the artwork. Still, Ravasco does loud Fontana for her art. He refers to her as a sort of divine craftswoman and praises her celestial manner in rendering nature. So clearly, Rabasco had gazed upon this earlier version of Minerva, who now, uh, and now it's on the left side here, dons a translucent chemise with red bows, uh, preparing to dress her into perhaps a more ornamented gown. So in a, another especially intriguing section of the poem, uh, Robosco comments further on the artist's composition. And I want to give you some of uh, what he says here, because I find it really intriguing. He states, quote, but you depict Venus by representing Pallas and the deceit appears double. So the hunter himself often falls victim of the deceit of his own trap. The poem later continues. And even though the helmet covers her locks and keeps the spear and the shield next to her, the vivid irony of the beautiful naked body reveals Venus, end quote. In short, Robosco's words comment upon arguably the strangest element of this composition, the rendering of Minerva, the goddess of wisdom, crafts, and virtue, as a tantalizing semi-nude figure. This is uh, very obscure. Uh, before delving deeper into this point, I, I wish to, to second Vi's assessment of the poem actually having influenced Fontana's second Minerva, as segments of his prose indeed seem to register some of the compositional changes uh, that happen in the second version. So perhaps he did have uh, some uh, leeway in this. He wrote, quote, I have already pictured the image of the following Minerva's helmet, which we see has no longer on her head in this later version. He also states, quote, and if you look more carefully, you can picture invisible Amorini uh, around her feet, little cupids. And indeed, she includes that again in that second one. So it's possible that Borghese, who was friends with Altemps, uh, saw this work and wanted his own version, and he had enough money and power to get it. Um, and he probably wanted one with an even higher erotic charge, uh, and which he indeed receives as the goddess now is fully undressed. And as Tatini has noted, the Cardinal already had several ancient statues of Minerva in his collection, including a sculpture of Pallas with her shield and helmet. So a painting like this would have been really a, a welcome piece in his collection. 
uh, regardless of whether he bought it finished or not. Okay. Well, such a if, work likely had. If I'm I sorry. Caroline, yes, please. I, I was trying to imagine this boys' club in, in the Rome of the beginning of 17th century, the uh, Altens and, and Borghese at the same time trying to compete about uh -huh. these but two versions of, of Minerva Venus and, and the uh, gossips in Rome yes. and artistic circles about. Uh, which one of them is the best and stuff like that. I mean, it's it's the ultimate boys club. Oh, for sure. To get these, these kind of images. And, and oh my gosh, if anyone that knows the uh, the Rome Sambians in this era, it's, it's like uh, no one can remain quiet. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. It was very, very riotous, very competitive. Uh, um, I Borghese was definitely a big player. Uh, it really helped when his uncle became Pope. That gave him even more power and money and prestige. So I think um, it's, you know, not a coincidence that after his uncle becomes Pope, uh, he likely saw that painting by Fontana in his friend's collection. Is like, well, I want another one, but it's going to be even better, even sexier, uh, even uh, more strange, right? Just to kind of one up him. And I think that competitive spirit definitely uh, yeah, is present. More nakedness without the helmet. I mean, that, that, yes. The, uh, the yeah. helmet is a quite important one. Yeah, uh, and now she's got like a string of pearls on her head, so she looks even less like Minerva, which is confusing, right? Yeah. <laughs> so while such a work had, a, I think, a very limited and private viewing audience, you can't imagine that the Cardinal just let anyone see this work of art, right? I think regardless, this painting would have been seen by his esteemed friends uh, and associates, and that possibly could have included women as well. Um, I know he entertained um, several prostitutes, right? That he would have not been ashamed to show this to. Uh, likewise, each viewer who stood before Fontana's masterpiece, I think surely had their own reaction or response to this be uh, beautiful nude palace before them. Um, and I'm sad, I you know, I just discovered this painting not too long ago and it's still in the, the, the Borghese collection, but I, I, it's not on display. So if I, next time I make it to Rome, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna need to talk to someone and be like, why is this work not on display? This is, this is a masterpiece. At any rate, I think that both men and women would have been equally taken aback, at least initially by this painting, uh, in part because it was a woman artist who created it, right? Yeah. Um, so for the remainder of the, the time I have with you, after talking a little bit about the iconography, some of the interpretations that previous scholars have deciphered from the painting, I wanna to return to thinking about the reception of this work, uh, specifically considering how women viewers might have interacted uh, with such a piece, uh, including even past the Cardinal's lifetime. So most art historians who have analyzed this work have spoken to the peculiarities of this composition, uh, considering namely the fact that the chaste goddess of wisdom is depicted without clothes. That's a very rare occurrence. Uh, while all the deity's attributes are nearby, allowing early modern viewers and us enough evidence to decipher her identity, uh, the goddess's nude stance certainly would have caused some to question this attribution. As Liana Cheney has demonstrated through her work on the artist's mythological paintings, Lavinia Fontana's two nude Minervas certainly deviated from previous iconographic uh, interpretations, such as uh, fellow Bolognese Marcantonio Raimondi's print after Raphael's drawing of Minerva and Cupid. Or for example, uh, going back to Venice, uh, an oil paint, Jacopo Tintoretto's Minerva, uh, pictured here, sending away uh, Mars uh, from peace and prosperity. So typically, Minerva, as a goddess who was famous for her chastity, was known not only uh, to wear like a, a tunic or a peplum, uh, she also often wore a breast armor alongside bearing like a spear, helmet, and shield, as cited in uh, common books like Cartari's Images of the Gods, which Fontana herself might have read as a resource. However, as Trini has also demonstrated, uh, nude Minervas were not non-existent, 
as for one, Benvenuto Cellini famously cast one to adorn uh, the base of his Perseus statue uh, in Florence at the Loggia dei Lanzi. Uh, and if you think about like the judgment of Paris, that subject matter, you will uh, see Minerva nude there. Uh, but otherwise, uh, more often than not, she is shown like fully armored with clothes. Uh, due to her training received from her father and her contacts with scholars in Bologna, like Achille Bocchi, uh, I would argue that Fontana was really well-versed in emblematic and iconographic sources, well enough to have designed these Minerva compositions herself. She even helped her dad uh, create some of the drawings for Bocchi's uh, reprinting of this book in 1574, uh, which is uh, pretty cool. At any rate, while much has been written on the iconographic sources in this painting, uh, a lot less has been considered of the work's reception. So I want to spend the remainder of this time with you thinking about that. So for one, those who have studied this painting have largely written off the work's eroticism, claiming it to be, quote, completely divested of erotic notion, end quote. Uh, the goddess's nudity instead is interpreted by scholars as a symbol of her chastity or modesty, at best, uh, quote unquote, bordering on the erotic, which I think is BS. Uh, Liana Cheney herself is admitted to the painting's sensuality, but has argued that this, quote, non-sexual nude Minerva symbolizes pudicity. Sorry, someone said something. I didn't mean to talk over you. Oh, yeah. we, we were completely agreed with your okay, idea. <laughs> Yeah. Right? Yeah, it drives me crazy. Uh, so in other words, the subject of the painting ultimately transmits in scholars' eyes that this is a moralized message of prudence uh, via oh, Minerva. On. Yeah. She is triumphing over Eros, love, and lust, uh, you know, as signified through Cupid. Um, this has been the main interpretation of this painting, which um, I would disagree with. Uh, while certainly some might have wished to have read this painting, you know, in post-Tridentine Italy through such a moralized vein, like uh, Pelioti, right? Uh, I don't believe that this was the only way of viewing this composition, uh, uh, let alone how Borghese would have seen it. Um, as several art historians have noted, as did Ottaviano Robasco in 1605, the beauty and nudity of this Minerva certainly renders this chaste goddess uh, appearing more like a nude Venus, as painted famously by Titian in the 16th century, or as demonstrated in this really infamous statue of the Calibidian um, Venus, um, which was actually in the Farnese's collection, uh, who lived in Rome uh, by the end of the Cinquecento. Might have been an influence uh, to her as well. Excuse me, Caroline. Uh, this is this is awesome, but the girls need to change classrooms. Do you think we can do it in like, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes? Yeah, I can pause. Please, that's so sorry about that. This, this is fascinating and I would love to discuss it for a couple of hours more, but uh, they need to change classrooms. Yeah, of course. I I'm, I knew I'd go over, so I apologize, but I, I'd be happy. I'll probably take like 15 more minutes. Is it, Would that be okay? Go, go for it, but if, if anyone stands up and, and leaves, please don't get offended. Oh, no, 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 no. And like you're recording it too. So if anyone's curious to listen, yeah. um, and if you, if like I have my email on the last slide. So if we don't have time to talk, please email me with questions, comments. I would love to hear from you if That's we don't have time. Sure. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Fontana herself, as I, I mentioned earlier, she actually created several renditions of Venus herself, uh, the goddess of love, prior to the Minerva she painted uh, in 1604 and then 1613, including this really interesting painting of Venus and Cupid on the left, which scholars now claim to represent an actual woman, a Bolognese noble lady, Isabella Ruini, whose portrait uh, Fontana also painted uh, right around this time. So uh, according to Caroline Murphy, um, one, a big Lavinia Fontana scholar, she was like one of the first um, English writing scholars to consider uh, Fontana's art. Uh, Fontana created this Venus uh, as a sort of allegorical portrait of Ruini, who impersonates the pagan deity. 
And as other scholars have surmised, such a, a portrait likely had a pretty private viewership, right? This is a woman, a noble lady shown pretty, pretty much nude. <laughs> and this was likely created for the delight of herself and her husband, Giovanni Angelelli, and has likewise been accepted to be, quote unquote, overflowing with erotic uh, connotation. So mm -hmm. in comparison, in comparison to Fontana's portrait of Isabella Luini's Venus, I think that the artist's rendition of Minerva arguably conjures very similar sensual erotic associations, presenting viewers with a beautiful woman decked in pearls, both of whom very gaze knowingly at the viewer. Uh, what is more, L Lavinia's Minerva is shown at full length, allowing beholders to pre you know, appreciate all of her body, her voluptuous form from the side, uh, especially her left buttock, which really prominently is displayed nearly at the very center of the composition. So yeah, how is this not erotic? Uh, unlike Ruini's Venus, uh, who is portrayed with that transparent veil uh, and gems, uh, Borghese's Minerva is without any of that accoutrement, minus like the pearls atop her head. And unlike Ruini's goddess as well, Minerva is not preoccupied with tending to the infant Cupid, who desperately seeks Venus's attention in the 1592 composition, which to me makes it a little less erotic that she's, you know, getting uh, annoyed by this baby here. <laughs> Instead, Fontana's Minerva very prudently provides a shiny metallic object for the young amorous god of love to occupy himself with, allowing the goddess some time to herself. Well, she is the goddess of wisdom after all, right? So regardless of the two paintings variances, um, I think both compositions arguably portray Lavinia Fontana's exceptionality as a woman painter in her rendering of the nude figure. Uh, and this isn't something I haven't really spoken to much yet, but it's really important. This was a subject that was, as you probably know, was purposefully occluded from all early modern women artists' education. So amongst the many obstacles that a pre-modern woman painter faced, such as their limited ability to travel, uh, not to mention their lack of, you know, contraception, uh, women artists also lacked the access to study live nude models, as it was believed that seeing a naked body threatened a woman's chastity, of course, mm -hmm. and thus was inappropriate for any honorable woman in early modern society to view. Regardless of these obstacles, though, um, which likely kept Fontana from studying uh, live models, we have no proof that she did, uh, the artist still rendered figures in the nude, um, perhaps using her own body as her primary source. Uh, likewise, I'd argue that Fontana's nude Minervas, amongst her other paintings of the nude, served as a sort of challenge to patriarchal expectations of women, including women artists, ultimately claiming that a woman's worth permeated beyond the bounds of her own beauty or chastity. Mm -hmm. So getting into the kind of social historical context here. In early modern Italy, particularly in the 16th century, uh, quite a few uh, misogynist texts were published on the comportment of women and their role in Cinquecento society. So alongside earlier texts by Francesco Barbaro, even Leon Battista Alberti wrote them in the 15th century, relaying essentially a woman's uh, limited place and her inherent inferiority to men, uh, later authors like Baldessare Castiglione, Lodovico Dolce, and Giuseppe Passe, just to name a few, also published uh, on women and uh, trying to essentially limit their place in the early modern world. And this conduct literature very purposely pigeonholed women to the domestic sphere, arguing that her main roles in life should be, you know, keep to maintaining the household. And most importantly, God forbid, protect her chastity to the death. And as Torcato Tuasso, another who wrote uh, of this, uh, noted in his book on women, since a woman's sole virtue was her modesty, her chastity, she needed to maintain it at all costs keeping herself from the public eye, locking herself up literally was the best way to go about dealing with women. Lodovico Dolce similarly penned that a woman should treasure her chastity amongst all else, noting that if she deprived herself of it, she essentially ruined her own life. Some of the language in these texts are just absolutely insane to read. Uh, 
to my eyes now, basically telling women that if you're going to lose your chastity, you might as well kill yourself. It's very strong language. Um, this is like a fair tactics. Yeah. Yeah, the case, the case of Lucretia in, in Roman mythology is one of the most important examples of how chastity is much more important than uh, your own life. I mean, uh, yes. that, that's, a, that's a virtue example, which is very powerful at this time. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. Yeah, like, that's why you see so many paintings of, like, Lucretia, right? She's this, this paragon of virtue because she killed herself after she was sexually violated unfairly by another man. But yet she's this paragon of womanhood that men wanted to... <laughs> Uh, women to look up to in the period. So if one were to compare these texts, right, to the life of Lavinia Fontana, I think one can quickly conclude that such prescriptions were ignored by this woman artist. Not only was Fontana the primary earner of her household income throughout her entire life as a painter, her husband, as we know, John Paolo Zappi, was relocated as the primary caregiver of her children and the financier of her career. Furthermore, Fontana's rich education as a youth in Bologna in the fields of painting, Latin, and music arguably rooted her early success as an artist and further bolstered her ambitions to transgress the bounds of her period's gendered expectations. And I think uh, I showed this earlier, but I didn't really talk about it. One self-portrait that arguably visualizes these motivations is this uh, tondo portrait uh, for Alfonso Chacon. Uh, and this is a real small oil painting on copper. She was known to actually early in her career paint a lot on um, metal surfaces. Um, so this was rendered in 1579, just after marrying Zappi. And this portrait was sent to the Spanish Dominican scholar because he was collecting a whole retinue of images of famous men and women to recreate and print. And this was going to uh, feature essentially 500 illustrious figures um, from antiquity to the present day. And it's pretty cool that Fontana would be included in that. So while Fontana is capturing her, you know, physical beauty in this painting there, uh, she's also donning a very high cut and luxurious gown, right? Wearing a necklace uh, of a crucifix around her neck, noting her piety, uh, her humility, but also her, her wealth and success already as a painter. And we see that she's holding a, a pen in her hand, gazing confidently out at the viewer, surrounded by these small statues. Uh, and a few of these are nude. And I think by placing herself amongst these sculpted fragments, um, and Frederica Jacobs has said as much, um, that she's attempting to portray herself in a more masculine light, right? As an artist surrounded by her humanist collection. Uh, what is more, Margaret King sur similarly surmised that this painting served as a sort of testament to the artist's creative abilities to work beyond the quote-unquote female genre of portraiture. So returning once more to Fontana's Minerva dressing, I would claim that the painting uh, in and of itself served as a sort of similar manifestation of her contempt for patriarchal society's limitations on women, demonstrating that a woman artist could literally work in any genre she chose, including the nude. Similarly, the painting might speak to a woman's virtue uh, needing to be measured beyond her own ephemeral beauty or bodily purity. Rather, her worth should be determined by her intellect and ability to create. While perhaps this wasn't the end goal of every painting that Fontana created, I would argue that by the end of her life, Fontana might have reassessed her unique status as a woman painter, especially considering recent feminist publications on the very merit of women, as penned by uh, very famous uh, Venetian authors Moderata Fonte and Lucrezia Marinella. Uh, even though these women were based in Venice, uh, their treatises essentially uh, were, you know, disseminated throughout the European continent. So these were both published right around the turn of the 17th century, uh, so about 10 years prior to her making her Minerva for Scipione Borghese. And these two women authors essentially refute the previous misogynist renderings of women, arguing for their need of greater independence and access to education. As the character Corinna blithely states in Fonte's Merits of Woman, quote, 
And when it's said that women must be subject to men, the phrase should be understood in the same sense as when we say that we are subject to natural disasters, diseases, and all the other accidents of this life. It's not a case of being subject in the sense of obeying, but rather of suffering and imposition. Not a case of serving them fearfully, but rather of tolerating them. Uh, likewise, Leonora, another woman featured in Fonte's text, calls for her gender's independence, crying, quote, Come on, let's wake up and claim back our freedom and the honor and dignity they have usurped from us for so long. Do you think that if we really put our minds to it, we would be lacking the courage to defend ourselves, the strength to fend for ourselves, or the talents to earn our own living? End quote. So even if Fontana herself did not read these treatises firsthand, arguably their popularity in early 17th century Italy and assuredly their feminist message reflected the artist's very own pursuits throughout her career. As a painter who served as the breadwinner for the Fontana family and received an excellent education under her father Prospero and the fellow Bolognese academics surrounding her in her youth, Fontana surely would have agreed, I think, with Fonte and Marinella's text, which called the need for women's education and freedom, virtues that were in fact tied to the goddess Minerva herself. So in closing, uh, returning our attention once more to this painting, I would argue that the aging artist who had suffered the death of eight of her 11 children, and at this point was struggling terribly with arthritis and an aging body, painted the second Minerva as a proclamation of the worth of women and their intellectual capabilities that they could muster if only given the chance. While the painting ended up in the hands of Scipione Borghese, Fontana must have anticipated future viewers, including women like us, who would gaze upon Minerva, the goddess of wisdom and the arts. Rather than betray a modest figure whose virtue is iron tight, as symbolized by the armor that usually donned the goddess body, Fontana instead presents us with an eroticized nude, one who has the agency to shed patriarchal society's expectations of her. Such a painting arguably portrayed to female viewers, especially later women artists like Elisabetta Sirani and Julia Lama, um, that a woman's merit was not tied to her own reflection in the mirror or her sexual activities, but rather to, like the goddess Minerva herself, her autonomy and skills and wisdom and the arts. So um, that's the end of that talk, but just to kind of wrap things up, uh, just for like two minutes, I'll kind of tell you that uh, not long after she painted that piece, she passed away in Rome in 1614 uh, and was actually buried uh, in Rome in Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, ironically. Uh, of her 11 kids, she was only survived by three of them. Um, but she essentially, uh, the, the tombstone that marked her grave, which is unfortunately now destroyed, uh, referred to her uh, as a painter whose fame reached outside the feminine sphere. Um, so she was a significant artist in her day and age, uh, a product of both her time and culture. And although she did conform in times, you know, to uh, female behavior, she became a wife and a mom. She also transgressed the confines of her sex, right? By becoming the successful uh, professional artist. Um, so that's that's all I have for you uh, today. Uh, thank you so much for uh, listening. If there's time for any questions or comments, I'd love to hear them. This is a, a fairly new project. So um, any insight would be welcome. Uh, and I'll do my best to answer your questions if you um, have any. Well, thank you very much. It's, it's quite late. So uh, maybe one or two very, very fast questions. I uh, actually have like three or four of them, but uh, I, I'm going to WhatsApp you with that uh, because mm -hmm. I, I, I have I have a strong feelings about this painting and, and the things you just said. But I, I would love if, if someone is interested in doing a very fast question before going to the next class um, or simply say thank you very much thank you really so much it. yeah that thank works you too much. Thank, thank you, you. Yeah. it's a very good yeah. question thank you thank you. Uh, i think we can end here with a huge thank you from us and we Hi. really appreciate it having you here and, and more because it's, it's your spring break and, and you oh. need to 
enjoy your free time. I I would love uh, to meet you again. As I know. As I'm not going to RSA, but I will be in Toronto in 16th Century Society Conference. Maybe yeah, maybe. I'm hoping to be there, Toronto, this year. I need to write an abstract still. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Way yeah, no. that, that, that's the problem. Okay. Thank you very much, Caroline. Thank I, you. Uh, I, if you have any questions, that's my email address right there. So please feel free to uh, write me. Um, thank you. Yes, thank you again. Uh, have a lovely day. You too. Enjoy. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Gracias. Déjala, déjala, no te preocupes. Ya les explico mucho. Gracias. Gracias, Joshua.